everybody. Good day to you all. Good evening if you're calling in uh, in the evening. Um, hope today, International Women's Day, is going <laughs> great for you all. Uh, today, we are joined by Rideshare Companies as we dive into how best to center drivers' needs um, as we electrify the rideshare sector in our webinar, Plugged In, a driver-centric centered approach to electrifying rideshare. I am Symbiat Yusuf, the Member Relations Manager at Ford. And before the panel starts today, we have a few updates from the Ford team. Attendees, we ask that you submit all your questions through the attendee chat. We will be sending the presentation shortly after the webinar today. If you have any questions, please send them as this is a roundtable discussion. Send them as uh, they come and um, we'll get them answered in our roundtable discussion. Uh, fourth, who are we for some of our new folks and some uh, that might have forgotten about fourth and what we do? We are on a mission to electrify transportation. We bring people together to create solutions to reduce pollutions and barrier to access for clean transportation. Um, we work in four focus areas, which are industry development, demonstration project, access to car through community uh, consumer engagement, and uh, policy advocacy. So with all of that, we are hoping to advance clean and equitable transportation. And the work we do on these webinars cannot be possible without the support of our members and sponsors. So we want to use this opportunity to thank our members and our sponsors for supporting the webinar program and supporting the mission at Ford. If you're interested in membership or sponsorship opportunities, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, Symbiat Yusuf. My email is on the slide. I will also be sending the webinar recap, so my information will be on that as well. And we are hiring. Don't you want to join the Fawn Fourth team? We're currently hiring a business development manager. If you or someone in your network is currently looking for opportunities, please uh, apply. Uh, more information will be included in the webinar recap on this position and how to apply and how to get more information about this. So come join us at Fourth. <laughs> A little update on the Roadmap Conference, which is going to be happening this June um, 29th through the 30th. Um, we have some sunny, beautiful weather and a lot of networking with all of you. We want to announce the Mobility for All sponsorship application is currently open. The we're currently accepting applications for the Mobility for All Scholarship. The scholarship provides conference access to individuals from community-based organizations who are working to make clean transportation accessible in historically underserved communities and communities of color. We are now accepting applications through Monday, April 19th. More information will be added, and if you're looking for any additional information about the conference, the scholarship, the program, or our speakers, um, that could be found at roadmapforth.org. And with that, I will pass it along to our moderator today, Lindsay, who is a program manager at Forth. Lindsay? Hi there. Thank you, Cindy, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to guide this conversation today. Um, we will be uh, discussing a driver-centered approach to rideshare electrification. So discussing opportunities to empower drivers to make the switch to a cleaner mode of transportation. Um, we will discuss essentials such as charging time, financial opportunities, and more. Uh, that we need to do to electrify the rideshare sector. And I would like to introduce all of our speakers. Uh, first, we have Roth Robinson, the co-founder and CEO of eCara. Rock was working for Apple in his business about in business development, while his partner worked for Uber. When they realized there's a strong demand for premium, clean luxury rides, especially in the business to business space. 
so they decided to create a rideshare company that was environmentally friendly. Operating by the tagline, Rides That Matter, Ikara uses strictly electric vehicles for an experience that's sustainable, fast, and luxurious. With its fleet of about 25 Teslas, Ikara offers a premium ride experience that's customizable through its iOS app. We also are joined by Raven Hernandez, the CEO and founder of Earthrides. Raven is the founder and CEO of Earthrides, the only all-electric ride-hailing app. Raven, alongside her partner, Peter Smith, launched Earthrides in October 2020 in her hometown of Nashville, Tennessee, to deliver eco-friendly transportation alternative. Raven is a first-generation Latina American and graduate of the Pepperdine Caruso School of Law. Prior to launching Earthrides, Raven worked as an attorney at a female-owned law firm. Earthrides' mission is to accelerate the adoption of electric vehicles while creating an ecosystem where healthy is cool. Earthrides is an all-electric rideshare app with a mission to reduce carbon emissions and provide better rideshare service than what currently exists. Earth is in Tennessee and Texas and has raised 1.75 million to date. And we also are joined by Trinelle Doyle, the CEO and founder of Go Girl Ride. Trinelle Doyle is a Uber driver and the founder of the soon to launch Go Girl Ride and is a person-centered safety authority uh, committed to creating a lane in the rideshare industry that centers identity as its core value. With more than 15 years of service and operations experience, Trinella is not only an advocate, but a champion for transportation justice that is radical in its effort to meet people where they are. And last but not least, we're joined by Gabe Etzhoken, the senior EV contributor at the Rideshare Guy. Uh, Gabe is a veteran transportation professional with over 60,000 trips between taxi cabs, Uber, Lyft, and other gig platforms. He's been writing professionally about motorcycles since 2004 and got into writing about rideshare in 2015 and joined Harry Campbell's The Rideshare Guy in 2018. His goal is to offer his experience and expertise as a resource for other drivers, accelerating the electrification of the personal transportation fleet. He lives in Oakland, California with his wife and son and a cat, a cranky old cat, he says. <laughs> um, so thanks again, everyone, for joining the conversation. Uh, we'll be having more of a roundtable discussion today rather than having all of our speakers present. So there are some topics we're going to discuss to start the conversation off, but we invite all of you to plug questions in the chat and we'll make time to cover audience questions later as well. Um, all right, welcome everyone, thank you. And um, my first question, I actually kind of want to start more broadly um, when we're talking about a driver-centered approach. Um, I want to kick the conversation off with what are the driver needs today? And anyone can start. Trans transparency, I think. Um, knowing what they're making and knowing the margins on every ride and every mile is um, the most important, right? They, they own their own business. And so with that in mind, we need to know the financial side of business operations. Somebody is rocking out to some good music back there. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I don't know uh, if someone who has music in the background wants to mute in the downtime, but that'd be great. Um, Transparency, yes, Raven. What else do drivers need here? I think drivers need safety. Um, safety and assurances, which I think also goes in alignment with what Raven was saying. Nice to meet you, Raven, by the way. <laughs> um, I know um, as a current driver and as someone who talks to a lot of drivers often, um, we, we, we feel unsafe. We don't feel protected. We don't feel considered. So I would say that safety. I would, you know, if I, I'm sorry, can I, I'm just going to jump in. Uh, I'm going to say that drivers need a uh, community. They need uh, organization. They need some sense of belonging and not being, not existing in this kind of Randian 
universe where we're all our own, you know, islands, uh, you know, seeking to become successful on our own. We need to understand that we are workers in an industry and we have a right to, or we have a right to organize and we'll, we'll never have what we need unless we organize because the companies and the customers will always come before us if we're not organized. You know, I think all you guys are right, and, 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 and I think it gets down to options and controls, you know, that there's so many middlemen in this space where a lot of operators don't know they have options and they don't know they have controls. And so I think, you know, if, if we can continue to inform and, and build options and controls for operators, then they can do whatever they want and they can be... Uh, you know, as dynamic and powerful as they wish to do whatever they like. So I think, you know, everybody's right in that sense, but options and controls are like, ultimately, I think what the drivers really need, you know, if it's, you know, how, how do they see the, that money and how do they go get that money, right? How do they create their own source of revenue um, with, with a B2B scenarios or how do they, make their own schedules, you know, how do they um, have flexibility and how do they have freedom? All those things kind of wrap up into these controls and, and you know, options. And so um, ultimately, I think, you know, you know, Uber and Lyfts of the world, they, they, they brought some of that and, and ushered in this gig space, right? So you have these people who are, that really don't understand anything about logistics or transportation you know they were like a school teacher that decided that they were going to go make some extra money so guess what they didn't have the knowledge base to understand what's really going on behind the scenes with these movements right and so you know we got to we got to help in, inform people of what's really going on in logistics and so that they can have those options and controls because people don't need to be a part of any, you know, platform, honestly, you could, you could, any you know, ride sharing is not rocket science. You know, anybody with a car and some keys can go make money and do this. But, you know, when you want to be effective and clean and sustainable and scale and do all the good things as a group, you know, options and controls, that's what I think. Yeah, really great answers, everyone. And good job thinking of, different areas of need in a driver's life too. everything from safety and transparency to those options and controls and Gabe really appreciate the community and organizing uh, note as well. Um, we already have questions coming in, which is really exciting. And um, one that, that I think piggybacks on this driver needs is how will these new rideshare platforms, um, and especially Rock and Raven, your wheels on the ground, how will you handle the employee contractor issue for your drivers? Well, I know Rock and I will not be spending $200 million uh, to go against one way or the other <laughs> to start. Um, you know, I, I, it's embracing the it's very changing effective. times. Yeah. It, you know, I, it's interesting because Drivers specifically, obviously, I'm mentioning Prop 22 in California. Um, you know, they were they were marketed that you don't want to be an employee, you don't want W2. You know, you can get benefits in, in other ways, and this is bad thing. And you know, that was the that was the the, the the angle that was taken. Yet, it's you have to make an educated decision. It depends on what's right for you. And to answer that question from Courtney, um, what we're doing is we're allowing a mixed model. And so we have a fleet that we own and you can be a driver, a W-2 with health benefits and um, other incentives that are just, you know, typical, hey, I've got my schedule and I don't drive my own car and I know what I make. I have a guaranteed hourly minimum and then opportunities to make. So at, at Earth, you know, we've got our base and then we have different special events. We'll have different B2B clients that pay different rates and you know, we have uh, a little bit more flexi flexibility to go on different prices. And then our 1099s who own their own electric vehicle 
can drive just like Uber and Lyft. And that's where we really shine in regards to, like I mentioned earlier, with the transparency is right now we pay 75% of every dollar to an individual who owns their own vehicle. And that's really important because I want you to be able to say, hey, if I made $100, if I did $100 worth of rides today, 75 of that was mine versus, oh, well, you know, it was kind of here. It was kind of there. I don't really know how much I made and all of that. So that's the angle that we're approaching it from and allowing those individuals to also down the road have some options for health benefits and things of that nature is, is really important because just, you know, just because you're 1099 doesn't necessarily mean you're any less worth those, those benefits. I was, I was I was giving snaps to that um, because I think the reason why it's taking me so long <laughs> is because I have also I wish that we had more access to healthcare and things like for everyone in this country. Like I just wish it was free. Period. Um, <laughs> I think it should be. Um, but that I share the same sentiments as we're preparing to roll out and to launch where it's like, okay, I wish everyone could just be staffed so that we could guarantee benefits um, and more resources. And I know that also is a similar model that we have taken to, um, we are launching the ride share portion, but also I think focusing also on B2B because there are more resources I think that come that way where you can have more folks on staff. I also think um, just like, you know, maybe they'll take this idea and they should, um, but I think there are still resources that you can provide um, to your contractors, just like we hire, you know, they hire engineers and everyone that it takes to make these organizations run. Maybe you can hire health providers too, or, you know, just try to partner and focus more on community to bring more access to your riders as well. There's a question here that talks about the the gold standard, and I don't necessarily know if there is one yet. I mean, it's we're breaking down in, uh, the taxi industry that's been there for so long, and we're evolving it, and now we've got technology in place. And, you know, I think that's what m us on this call are trying to do is create that gold standard, because what, what has been created is being propped up, and it's not sustainable in, in a lot of ways. Really, quite frankly, it's not for sustainable for anyone, not for the driver, not for the rider and not for the company. And so, you know, that's what our uphill challenge has been at earth is how do we show that there is a ride share out there that has a um, successful fi financial business plan, right? That's, that's what we've had to show to our, um, our investors, uh, and as well as potential investors is that there is a gold standard that does meet the needs of everyone, right? It has to be a business model that makes the business money first and foremost. It's a for-profit. Um, and then it has to be uh, advantageous for the driver so that there's a low churn. And then at the same time, we can't forget about the rider. And so, you know, I think this conversation is super important because the only way the rider has a great experience on any platform is if the driver is taken care of. That's, that's your, that's your frontline defense, right? Like, that's really the most important person. It's not the rider at the end of the day, because you can't put the rider first if the driver is not feeling a part of the company. You know, they're the one doing the rides. Yeah, I can't I can't do every ride. I would love to. I, I love doing rides, but it has to be something that people can buy into and feel like 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 Gabe was saying, a part of a community and feeling like, OK, I've got this mission and, and I want to do it to my, the best of my ability. So I don't know of any gold standard, but I'd be curious to hear if anyone else on the panel has companies that, you know, they're looking at as the gold. I've, uh, I mean, I've had personal experience renting a lot of different electric vehicles and gas powered vehicles riding for the rideshare guy. So I've bumped into a lot of different kind of rental models for rideshare drivers so that they can use an electric vehicle or whatever kind of vehicle they need to do their work. And it seems to me that there's no, um, there hasn't been like an Uber, if you'll, if you'll pardon that analogy of, of rental for the car share, for rideshare drivers. I don't think anyone's really hit on a good combination, something that's really like taking off. I mean, there's a lot of platforms out there that where you could actually go get a car, uh, you know, Turo and uh, uh, rider share. Um, 
there's a local startup called OXO that I just tested. And it's kind of depending on people to provide the inventory, you know, just regular participants in the platform to provide the inventory for drivers to rent. Um, but that model, I think, has a lot of problems with it that are that's going to keep it from being really competitive with a driver just purchasing a used vehicle, uh, which is like the most economic solution right now for most for most drivers. Well, it's the most economic, but it's also the most difficult. I was just talking to uh, an Uber driver uh, here in Nashville, and he's paying twenty five hundred dollars a month to rent an SUV. That's more yeah. than rent. I mean, that's. Yeah. I mean, when we talk about equitable, it's like he's. But his to his point is, oh well, I can't afford the down payment of a vehicle. So we can easily afford, you know, the monthly payment. And so to Ellen's question is, you know, how can incentives for EVs be more equitable? It, it takes time. You know, that's that's what I see is I remember, you know, we all remember when the iPhone came out. It was it was a, a status symbol, right? It was like classism of its finest of, you know, I've got the MacBook, I've got the iPad, I've got the iPhone. It's taken time for there to become more affordable options and also Quite frankly, you know, I'm a big proponent of EVs, but I'll tell you right now that there are some kinks that need to be worked out. Uh, it doesn't, it's not maintenance free. I mean, it's definitely low maintenance, but when it's messed up, it is messed up and it ha and it does take some time and patience just because it is such a new um, arena that we're dealing with and, and the pipelines aren't as strong as the legacy OEMs in the ice space. So, you know, unfortunately, I think it takes time um, as well as people like Forth companies like Forth um, being, you know, champions and, and, and really bringing it to our attention. You know, we work with, I, I talk to OEMs uh, on a weekly basis of how can we get affordable electric vehicles into a least, at least a lease to own program, not a rental program to pay $2,000 a month to rent a car. To me, that is, that, that's like, you know, the meatpacking industry in the 1920s in New York, where you work at the, you work at the factory and you live at the factory and you never make money, you know, and you're always in this, in this cycle, this perpetual cycle of, of poverty. So, you know, time. Yeah. Uh, Raven, uh, I don't, am I allowed, can I, this might be a conflict, but I'm, I'm working for a company called Flux EV mm -hmm. and Flux EV is, uh, it has a lease to own model. Amazing. That, yeah. And they're actually, and what's they're, the price on that? Well, it's going to vary on the model that you, and uh, and your usage so what do you know like an averagely monthly price i think they're they're i'd have to look at the website so i don't want to give any incorrect yeah. information but it, it would wind it would work out to be a lot less than um than a regular vehicle lease or uh or rent or renting a, a lot okay. less so, so um, rent from flux yeah. drive on earth uh yeah i guess that would work <laughs> the main problem with the, the main problem with EVs that sorry to step on you, Trinell. Um, but the, the the problem with EVs right now is um, supply chain constraint is really hampering production and also the legacy automakers um, they didn't want to make EVs for a very very long time and now they're being dragged kicking and screaming and they're starting to invest some serious money into building EVs but. There's going to be a shortage of new EVs as well as used EVs um, over the next five to 10 years as people start to realize like, whoa, this is the future and I have to get one of these. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's going to, that's going to affect pricing for, for rideshare drivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that ties into what Bradley uh, asked a question, how can states assist ride hailing drivers and fleets to go electric, what are the biggest hurdles, vehicle cost, charger, access, other? Um, those are the hurdles. I think we need more initiatives with um, both local and national government. I do know that um, the current administration is, you know, focused on um, going all things EV. I mean, look at gas prices right now. I think that is going to, um, you know, I, I hear so many people who I never imagined, even my parents talking about like, oh, I think I'm going to get an electric vehicle. But um, speaking of shortages, I know when I bought a new car a couple months back, there were none available. I mean, outside of, I mean, I didn't want a Tesla. I wanted to look at other, you know, other options and, and see what was out there. Um, 
But then when I also, you know, in these conversations that I've had with fourth and with drivers um, and just with good every, everyday people, um, I think another hurdle is just how equitable is it? Because, you know, it, it really goes into, yes, we want folks to get electric vehicles, but where are they going to charge those? Where are they going to house those? Where are they going to place those? They're like, it's such a, um, I think it's such a, a, a dynamic <laughs> um, situation uh, that, you know, where it's, there's like, there's not an easy, I don't think there's an easy answer, an easy solution, but I think it really does start with there being um, just more knowledge out there. Um, and then also with there being um, both local support and backing, like financial support and resources and backing from local and national government initiatives to make it more accessible to push production um, for vehicles as well, but then also um, education. Um, and then for a business owners like me, I we I mean, Lindsay can tell you, we worked all last year <laughs> to see how I could get access to a fleet. And there is a um, there's an EV company, Candy, who makes pretty, um, we looked at just like t buying Teslas, we looked at buying other fleets, other vehicles, but getting access and finances to purchase those, that's like a whole other thing too. So um, it's it's not an easy solution, but I think it will start with these conversations, um, meetings of the minds, and then also um, backing um, and pushes from uh, local and national governments as well. Mm -hmm. Ellen asked a really good question. Do you see purchase of used EVs as a good course for rideshare drivers? Um, what are incentives needs, which you just touched on, and then the downsides of owning an EV? And I can definitely speak to the, the first two of those. I mean, yeah, it, I believe it is. A, first off, it's an investment. Right now, the EV market, if you can get your hands on an electric vehicle, uh, you're going to keep it in good condition. Even it, even as you continue to put miles on it, you're going to be able to resell it at a really great value. There are times where We've priced out a car that we bought brand new that has 60,000 miles on it. We can sell it for exactly what we bought it for. I mean, you're not seeing that with gas cars. And obviously, the market is um, unique right now. And it, that, that trend will probably um, subside, you know, as more EVs come on the road. But yes, I mean, definitely, um, I do see it as a, as a good purchase. And also then for the environment, uh, you know, most drivers that you're looking at are, are lower income. So then you have to consider... Are they living in a frontline community? Are they living in a food desert? What is their community like? Bringing EVs into those spaces is really important for not only education, but also for cleaner air, right? That's less uh, tailpipe emissions going into those communities in and out every day. Uh, but yeah, of course there are downsides. You know, this is an emerging market. Like, let's not forget that. And there is, you know, if you get into a fender bender, uh, specifically with a Tesla, might be two or four week turnaround time, might be six weeks. The part might not be in stock for two months, you know, and so that's money lost because you're not able to drive. So there are some some things that you would just have to kind of weigh out there in, in regards to specifically, I, I'm thinking like fender benders when the turnaround times really affect your ability to make money on your vehicle. You know, that is something to, to significantly consider. Mm hmm. Yeah, there there seems to be a lot of logistical questions about driving an EV for rideshare and and mm -hmm. using an EV. I'm hoping to answer them if uh, you know if we have a if we move into that topic. Yeah, Gabe, please feel free to speak to that because I think everyone, uh, you know, has driving experience, but you've been on the road in an EV um, through your own independent decision making process. Uh, which is, uh, I actually, I'd be curious if you want to contextualize that with what compelled you to make that investment initially as well. Yeah, I, you know, I was, I've been doing motorcycle journalism for a long time and electric motorcycles started coming up as a topic. And I tested my first electric motorcycle in 2009. And I just enjoyed electric mobility so much because it's this kind of magic feeling of just gliding along. Um, with no engine noise or vibration or so it's this kind of really and the acceleration is terrific like it's it's just a great driving experience to drive an electric vehicle and I'm like whoa if I could have an electric car one day that would be great but then I started doing rideshare driving in 2014 and I noticed like even with a hybrid you're spending a lot of money on gas and this was back in 2014 when gas was you know like three bucks a gallon 
you're still spending, you know, three, four hundred dollars a month um, to drive full time. And I'm like, wow, it'd be great to have an electric vehicle. And California had electric vehicle uh, incentives at the time. Well, they still do. Um, and, and then the federal program started with the, the uh, uh, you know, with the infrastructure legislation and uh, after the uh, after the housing bubble popped. Um, anyway, I my wife bought a Fiat electric for commuting and I was like, oh, this would be great. You know, if only I could do ride share driving with the electric vehicle, but there really wasn't an affordable electric vehicle out there. There was a Tesla, but, you know, 70, 80 thousand dollars like no one you know, can't do that. So it was my dream. And then the Chevy Bolt came around and I'm like, OK, I'm going to get a Chevy Bolt. And I went back and forth. And I finally bought it, financed it. Um, and uh, after about a year and a half, um, got a, you know, the recall issue with the battery started up. And so I uh, complained to General Motors. They made a buyback offer. It gave me enough money to buy a Tesla, which, you know, now I own outright. And so, and obviously this is a great experience. I think for a rideshare driver, I mean, if you're privileged enough to be able to afford an electric vehicle, I think it really gives you a big leg up over other drivers because you're just not spending the money on gas. If I had a long ride to San Jose from San Francisco, um, right now gas is getting close to $6 a gallon in California. It's getting really insane. Um, and I had a, like a 25 mile per gallon car. Um, and I had like, I would spend a quarter or a third of what I made on that trip on gasoline, especially if you consider having to deadhead back to somewhere where you're going to get another ride. Um, so it's, and then it would cost like a dollar 50 in the Tesla. And plus I'd get paid an extra dollar by Uber because they're incentivizing electric vehicles a tiny bit. Lyft doesn't. Um, and then the passengers have a great experience. And I think they're, you know, my tips are up by, you know, by two or 3%, um, you know, which means like 8% instead of five, <laughs> but still it's, it's, it's something. Um, and so I, I gotta say it's, it's been a really great experience driving electric and, and that's what I'm hoping drivers will start understanding and, and aspiring to. Of course, there's a lot of issues around, uh, range. And of course that, um, that's going to go to driving style and the kind of vehicle that you have. So that's going to be very individual to, to drivers. That's the thing with the, with, like with any rideshare driver, if you talk to a hundred rideshare drivers, you're going to get a hundred different answers about what the best car is. It's usually the car I'm driving right now is what they will tell you. Um, that's usually a Prius by the way, <laughs> which is not a terrible choice. Um, but I think if they spent some time driving an electric vehicle, they would understand uh, that it's just it's just a better vehicle for that. For that and Gabe, of. it's it's one of the reasons why it's better is the actual driving experience. I mean, the inertia of the car stopping itself versus you having put your foot on the brake, you know, the regenerative mm -hmm. braking in right. and of itself, you, you know, yep. yeah, absolutely. You know, and the safety mm -hmm. features, um, are, are really what makes the car shine on the actual driving portion, uh, you know, what you're actually doing, right. Is the driving of it. And then going into the charging infrastructure, there's a lot of questions in regards to that, you know, that you can really have some great savings depending on where you are. So, you know, in Austin, for instance, they have Austin energy and they allow for $5 a month unlimited level two charging five dollars i mean that's so basically you you charge overnight every night and you get a full deep charge and then you start your day off with you know 325 miles give or take uh, for five bucks you know one time a month i mean that's that's some crazy savings that that's in and of itself yeah it's amazing it's absolutely amazing so you know finding those programs and obviously they're going to vary you know city and by city and state by state but that's just one program in and of itself that really makes sense. And finding free level two charging, it is worth it, you know, when you start off with a free charge, at least that one charge in a day, you know, if you're charging twice a day and you get one for free, that that, that definitely helps with your, your uh, savings.
Of course, we should make clear that level two charging is very slow compared to fast charging. You're only going to And get, that's why you would deep charge overnight, right? That's why you you're would only start gonna, off. Sure. You'll, you'll get 25 miles of range for every hour you're on. The yeah, 25 to 40 in, in some cases, depending on you know what, what you're charging on. We, we've seen it go up to 40 miles an hour, but... We always ch charge overnight with, with level two. It also preserves the, the life of the battery and helps degradation. So level two charging for a great job, Gabe, on explaining what that is, is just, you know, not DC fast. So you're not there for 20, 30 minutes. You're leaving it overnight. You're starting with a full charge. Forgive the mansplaining. I have a terrible habit. No, no, no. It was a great, it's a, I mean, you know, it's good to explain, right? Um, you know, absolutely. Um, this relates, uh, uh, as far as charging as a topic, we have a question that came in. How can states work with rideshare companies to determine where to locate public fast and community charging for ride hailing drivers? And mm. uh, as, uh, as we open up this question, I, I have thought about charging hubs as a really important feature for drivers. Um, so I think, of course, curious about um, everyone's answers about how we can help inform location decisions. Um, yeah. they're, you know, they're around the whole community. So what what might be possible there? Okay, I wanted to address charging in general, and um, you know, people that don't own our, uh, electric vehicles. Um, that is one of their main concerns. Like, where am I going to charge it? Where am I going to charge it? And the answer is you charge it at home. And at this point, if you don't have a way to charge your charge an EV where you park at night or, you know, wherever you live, it's, I, in, in my opinion, it's not going to be a, a great, uh, choice for you unless you're really committed to like an EV driving lifestyle where you're going to be spending a few hours a week sitting at a charger or looking for chargers or trying to figure that out. Um, also with DC fast charging, you can only charge to 80% um, because the charging speed will slow way down after that point. Um, so, and, but the, but the good news is, is that 95% of electric vehicle owners, and I assume that also extends to rideshare drivers and talking to other rideshare drivers that use electric vehicles for work. Uh, the, my experience is that 95% of us are just charging at home and never really have to charge remotely. The exception is uh, a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers in areas where you have a lot more spread out population, like in Texas. Um, they are depending on some pretty long distance rides to make their money. So having access to fast charging, effective fast charging is really important. I was going to ask um, Raven with, because one of my concerns um, with EV is, right, like, so I know a lot, the, the mileage, the range just isn't that great still to me. Um, and so I don't know if you could share that, but the distance, like, is do you ever find there's a lag time when someone has to stop and charge, right, even at a fast station? I know a lot, I've had conversations with other folks um, considering going EV, and they're just worried about losing out on money while they're charging because obviously they can't drive because they, they have to charge. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's the perception, right? It's it's your angle on it. I don't think that the I don't think that the range is bad at all. Um, Three hundred twenty-five miles to drive straight uh, on a full charge, you're gonna be tired. You're gonna need a break, right? You're gonna need a twenty-minute break. Uh, to go and, and sit at a charger, to use the restroom, to to eat, to like breathe and get out of the car and walk around. So, you know, what we've done at Earth is for our employee drivers, they start the day off with a full charge. And then if they're working an eight or 10 hour shift, that 30 minute break that they're going to take anyways is when they go and charge, uh, charge time, chow time. And so we allow that, we bake that in. Now, of course, look, like, this is not science. It's not perfect. It's not perfected. And so there are times when it's like, oh, uh, John is going all the way out and that's a 40 mile ride and he's got 70 miles and it's 20 to the charger. So we're going to have to turn off his AC and he better regen brake as much as possible. And, you know, there are times we've never bricked a car where we like killed it and, and it, you know, we had to get towed. Um, but I have personally uh, pulled up to a charger with zero miles. Uh, yeah, it's happened. 
And you know, that's the it's fun. <laughs> it's a fun game, you know. We um, oh no, we, oh my wife, my wife freaks out when that no, happens. No, oh we, my god, I know we, we've had to train our drivers. It's like seventy miles is plenty. We're gonna get you down to twenty. You know, we're gonna make it work, and we're gonna squeeze as much juice out as possible. But look, like. Um, you can drive. I've driven across the country in, in my electric vehicles and our drivers drive all over Austin, all over Nashville. And yeah, it does take a little bit of planning, but, but we're committed. This is the cross that we're dying on, right? Like we are committed to this and we're not going anywhere. We're not changing to hybrid or gas because, you know, it's the inconvenience of having to sit at a charger for 25 minutes. It's just a different lifestyle, quite frankly. Like you go to the supercharger, you bust out some emails, you have lunch, you take a walk, you take your dog. Like it's a different, um, and in my opinion, my opinion, it's a more superior way of living because you are slowing down, right? You're not just go, 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 go. You're taking a minute to breathe. And I think that's kind of something we should all do at least one time in the day. I love it. Like, I think a slower pace <laughs> is just good. Just a slower, you know, 20 minutes. Concern, I think because... Me, and I guess me personally, I am a distance driver. Like I will pop to Seattle from Portland real quick or pass just to like go for a drive. And I think in Washington state, well, Vancouver, it depends on where you are. There are more rural areas outside of like the main city, like everywhere. Right. And so I guess like, I'm always just like, oh my gosh, what if I don't have a spot? But I think there should be like portable on the go. I think there's, Technology is evolving. It probably, it already exists. I'm sure it does where yeah. you can self-charge and, you know, I'm interested in that too, getting into that. So yeah, I, I, I agree a slower pace and yeah, I'm also an HR person. So I think people should be taking, taking rest periods. Well, legally, not, they have to, right? So, yeah, they, you know. They have to, but not, they should. And yeah, I think that's a really good point that you bring up where it's like, um, you know, I, I think it's important to like stop and breathe and rest and 20 and minutes out of 300 miles, you know, every 300 miles, give yourself 20 minutes. Yes. Actually, that's yeah, maybe even more than that. <laughs> every hundred miles. <laughs> Courtney said that she found level two charging useless. And I'm curious, Gabe, how many miles are you were you getting on your Chevy Bolt in a single charge? You're muted. Before I change tires, I would uh, get about the EPA uh, estimate or better. Uh, when I used aftermarket tires, you know the the non uh, Ecotopia tires, um, they it, it dropped down to about less around two hundred. Two hundred miles. But, yeah, I mean, but that's... You, you know, one thing about range is your driving strategy. Um, if you're in a dense urban area, I mean, my God, it's going to take you eight hours to All go day. through 200 miles, you know? Yeah. That regen um, breaking, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're coasting in at every stop sign, every red light. So, but, I mean, you know, a lot of drivers, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I just, no, no, no. the thought I wanted to complete is that, you know, a lot of drivers have long distance ride strategies or airport strategies that they mm -hmm. think is the best way to make money. My personal experience is not just a rideshare driver, but as a taxi driver, many years is at the airport's always a losing game. Um, and you'll waste a lot of time um, and not make as much money. So I focus on doing short trips because not only do you get paid more per mile if you have continuous back-to-back -back short trips, but you also are going to complete um, the various uh, gamified quest bonuses and lift uh, bonuses and challenges that that are where you make about thirty percent of your money uh, on an, as an Uber or Lyft driver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we have kind of a different experience because people tip really well at the airport uh, when you're taking them. You know, if you're taking someone at four a.m., they're tipping you twenty dollars most of the time, at least on Earth. Mm -hmm. And and so, but I will say with the waiting game, um, that's yeah. I mean. There's so many fees that just as a company uh, are included with the airports that are not fun. What should cities be doing to help support the TNC taxi drivers who wanted to, to who want to transition to electric? Um, you know, at the end of the day, it is also we can't depend on government to to solve the problems for us, right? Like we, you know, 
we have to create business models that are sustainable sustainable i think that's very that's that's my take on on things here in the u.s um very fortunate to be here in the u.s and to create a business and to be able to you know get credit and all these things that my family in panama just don't have the opportunity to do and so you know that's very appreciative but at the same time if the market doesn't want it then it's not necessarily the government in my opinion the government's job to create uh, something that isn't being sought after. So we need more people to want this and to be speaking up. And, you know, obviously we're seeing that. And, um, you know, within charging infrastructure, I think that's that's definitely an incentive. And I think, you know, even encouraging more renewable energy that feeds into the grid so that way charging infrastructure can uh, be more affordable. I, I think that would be a great angle, you know, here in Tennessee, if you've got solar and, you are bringing in more energy than you're using and you're putting back into the grid, you're not making any money. And I don't think that's fair. You know, you're, you're the one that's paying for that renewable and you're not making any money on it. So, you know, that's definitely something that, you know, I think the incentives around creating energy and using energy has, has to be thought of differently. That's that's a great point, Raven. I uh, I know that at this time, Rock has called in, and I just want to call on Rock specifically to contribute mm -hmm. at this time, if if you're able. Okay, uh, you're muted, Rock. And if you Mom can Rock. unmute. Okay, we'll, we'll work on this. Um, but yeah, thank you for the conversation so far. Rock, if you want to ping us um, when you find the mute, that'd be great. Um, great conversation. Thank you for making my job easy here. Um, I think, you know, we can jump over to another question and get into another angle as well. I think related to um, the the partnership aspect i think is really important so raven you're talking about um people being compensated for contributing clean energy to the grid that's a wonderful program idea um in the chat we're seeing uh portland's local charging program mentioned for 25 dollars a month unlimited off-peak charging network um with sites scattered across the metro area and even outside of it um, another program that comes to mind is actually one of Forth's own as far as financing goes. A credit union partnership was really important. What other um, resources and programs will help more drivers make this switch? And maybe actually I'd like to direct this to Trinell because as you're launching, um, you might be experiencing this question um, a little bit more, how you want to incorporate electric vehicles into your platform. Um, so I want to make sure I'm answering it right. <laughs> what, um, say it again, please, just for clarity. I I guess I'm curious about breaking down the upfront barriers and maybe these are actually, this is this becomes two different questions, but we, there are so many different um, challenges as a driver, even when an individual driver approaches mm -hmm. a financial institution and what they have to provide and what their situation might be is challenging. So our experience working with a credit union was uh, knowledge transfer. We learned about the underwriting process, and we let uh, the institution know uh, Point West Credit Union, they're Portland local, really great. And they they learned about the EV being a different type of investment and that depreciation on an EV looks different. So when they're assessing um, the investment that an individual wants to make with their own individual purses, purchase, that looks different. Um, and also that the income type is still going to be sustained for um, being able to fulfill the loan. You know, if if they're spending this much on renting a car, but now they want to buy one, 
Um, and I guess this also reminds me, because Raven, we've talked before, this reminds me too of drivers on your platform have used one of your vehicles, but then have gone on to purchase their own car. So I'm curious about, I guess, the impression that drivers can have working on these pla like platforms that incorporate electric vehicles and what can empower more drivers to do so, whether that's from your own companies, but also what would help your, your companies um, more from the outside resources and um, <laughs> uh, I'd like so, to add to that when she's done. Oh, go for it, Rob. Oh, for me? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, when, when she's done, sorry. Oh, I got you. Um, so I think this is a complicated answer for me, not because I don't, I have my thoughts, but um, I'm going to answer it as a black woman <laughs> um as a black person just as a person of color who and a minority um who like you said um it's it's not equitable in lending practices um and so i think it we're, what we're looking at is focusing on um partnerships um focusing on grants trying to find funding so that we can build our own while we work on investments and, and all those things so that we can build our fleet of vehicles that we own in addition to uh, folks using their own vehicles, like you said, so that we can lend out those. I think um, I'm also working on partnerships and um, connecting with, um, I, I don't know, people in the finance industry. Um, there are organizations here who do provide um, I'm thinking of Prosper Portland, who provide resources. They're their own bank because they found that it was not equitable and quite honestly, just racist and, and lending and things of that nature. Um, even if you meet the requirements, you know, to qualify for a vehicle, they find ways to, you know, turn down, <laughs> to deny and stuff. And so I think it's important to um, continue to establish those connections and partnerships um, with uh, folks who have more power um, and using their power to make it more accessible. Um, not only that, but I think there also has to be um, education about like the necessity, why it is important <laughs> to try to eliminate gas as many gas vehicles um, as possible. I don't think it's a, it, I don't think it's an easy answer. So for us with our fleet of vehicles that we, you know, get here with that, that we're working on making that accessible um but also we're we have to dig a little bit deeper and, and find resources and funding to get that you had a follow-up to that rock yeah i just wanted to add to that sorry i'm not having to call in but um you know what what raven and and the trinelle are doing is is just fantastic and here's what's so cool about this there is um, there is going to be a massive amount of financing and vehicles for fleets like what you guys are doing, and it right now it's not about financing. It's it's just about production. There's multiple groups out there that have a base of five hundred million dollars or more just to give or to finance to fleets. And then they'll, you know, recycle them in 20 years. That's their business models. In, in 2018, we were part of a contest called Spring Free EV. And uh, we won second place on a mileage purchase agreement, which allows fleet owners to, you know, distribute cars and pay for them by the mile. And everybody wins. And so now Spring Free EV, Sunil Paul in California, they have a platform now that will finance electric cars for you right now without all those biases, because they understand the market, they understand what's going on. So I think what what you guys could benefit from is figuring out how you're gonna utilize these vehicles on your platforms and how you're gonna use these options and controls, kind of like what Gabe was saying, where you don't really worry about deadhead miles when you manage the, the, the movements that you actually do. For example, we focused on airport transfers. So we don't have much deadhead miles. We go to the airport. Guess what? We're picking up somebody at the airport. So, it's, you know, we call them we call them roundups because we're winning. It's just a you know complete 
way of making every cent per mile that you can make and not worry about range because, yeah, range is an issue. But there's also <laughs> billions of dollars out there that's coming for charging infrastructures that I think you guys, ourselves, we're working on a, you know, a charging hub type model where it'll be a support system for those people out there that are using electric cars. But I would say that we're just so early, it feels like there's a lot of issues, but at the end of the day, in, in, in about 12 to 24 months, we're going to experience something in this space that we've never experienced before, and I would say we better be ready. Yeah, we're, we're so close to critical mass, I think, in, in terms of mass EV adoption. And, and once we reach that kind of critical sp- time, it's going to be so fast that we switch over completely or almost completely. Look at, look at the Super Bowl this year. The Super Bowl uh, ads were nothing but cryptocurrency and electric vehicles. What does that tell you about the next few years? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah, the, biggest, it's the as, biggest platform, it's the biggest advertising platform in the world. <laughs> and all they talked about is electric cars and cryptocurrency. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. So as this, this wave is, is coming, everyone, I want to close out with one last question. Um, and for platform developers, uh, I'm curious, and then Gabe, as, as a driver, uh, what is a core value from the driver-centric perspective that you want prioritized as we move forward with TNC electrification? whether that's in your business or from the driver angle that you have. Yeah. Janelle, let's start with you. Sorry, my sound. Can you say it again, oh, Lindsay? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I swear, I wanna... I'm like actively engaged. I'm... <laughs> No, that's okay. And um, my background's blurry because I just moved. <laughs> so I don't know if yeah. it's like... Talking about... Uh, no worries. We're talking about a core value that you want highlighted as we move forward in the wave of TNC electrification. Access. Um, well, as a value, um, a core value. Yeah, I would say um, access and accessibility for 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 the everyday person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good choice. Raven, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll say it again. It's how I started the call. Uh transparency. You know, it's the end of the day, we have to make money. The business has to make money. The driver has to make money. And the rider's paying that money, so they better have a great experience for what they're paying. So you know, transparency in that. And I think that if you, if you come with the mentality that we're all here to win, not just one party, then other things like access and benefits and cleaning the air will be a lot more natural to follow if everyone's being taken care of. Yeah, thank you. If Rock does, if, uh, if I can jump in front of Rock, Um, I would, I would say that the most important value for an individual driver working in this industry to have would be, a a thirst for knowledge, a thirst for information so that they can make informed decisions about their situation, how much money they're really making and to, and to just have that sense of professionalism and wanting to know about, about their trade. Mm-hmm. And Rock, are you able to close out with a, a value that you want highlighted for the the wave that's coming? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, for uh, our our company value is to reduce emissions and accelerate the utilization of electric cars. So that's kind of our value. And I think at the end of the day, what we would like to see is like how do we help Trinell get access for her team? And how do we help um, people like Raven have more transparency? 
in their in their business models and how do we how do we help other operators get more information access to vehicles and how do we that's that's what we think about a lot because we see these big things as you know big problems and they need to be solved and so you know from a platform's perspective that's what we want to do is help other operators be their best and do their thing the way they want to um however they see fit so yeah Mm -hmm. thanks so much everyone okay thanks thanks so much this has been so much fun meeting everyone and and uh, and then such great questions from from the attendees yeah thank you all so much for joining us today thank you to our panelists for such a great conversation and as we mentioned earlier we will be sharing the webinar recap with you all and that would include the recording of this um, session as well as some additional resources from our panelists so we just want to thank you all for spending this hour with us and we hope you can join us in two weeks on march 22nd tuesday at 10 a.m pacific time for a driving change with clean fuels clean fuel programs where we will um, discuss some lesson learned from California and Oregon and how we can um, take the best practices into future policies on accelerating equitable transportation electrification. Thank you all so much. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day, whether it's the day or the evening. Have a nice day, everybody. Bye.